Thanks for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. South Korea and the U.S. are not ruling out the possibility of North Korea staging major provocations like a nuclear test. As near the U.S. presidential election in November, Seoul and Washington's key deterrence dialogue body says. The body, for the first time, discussed specific ways to deal with such scenarios. And South Korea's economy contracted 0.2 percent on quarter in the second quarter this year due to weaker domestic demand. The Bank of Korea expects the economy to rebound 2.4 percent this year. Two students and two teachers were killed in a shooting at a high school in the state of Georgia. A 14-year suspect is now in custody with his exact motive yet to be identified. Officials from South Korea and the U.S. have discussed responses to what they believe could be a major provocation by North Korea around the time of the U.S. presidential election in November. Our Kim jong Shil starts us off. The fifth meeting of the Extended Deterrence Strategy and Consultation Group, or EDSCG, between South Korea and the U.S. took place in Washington on Wednesday local time. For the first time at the meeting, the two countries conducted a scenario-based discussion on North Korea's nuclear threats to strengthen policy planning and coordination. South Korea's first vice foreign minister, Kim hong yoon told reporters after the meeting that the EDSCG discussed a range of possible provocations by Pyongyang and responses around the time of the upcoming U.S. presidential election. He said both Seoul and Washington believe a major provocation around that time cannot be ruled out as North Korea continues to enhance its nuclear capabilities and its continuing provocations, including jamming GPS signals or sending balloons carrying waste. Kim and Deputy Minister for National Defense Policy Cho chung nae led the South Korean delegation, while Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Bonnie Jenkins and Acting Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Kara Avikrombi led the U.S. delegation. The U.S. Department of Defense released a statement shortly after the meeting and said the U.S. reiterated its ironclad commitment to draw on the full range of its military capabilities, including nuclear, to support extended deterrence for South Korea. The statement added that both sides reaffirmed that any nuclear attack by the DPRK against the ROK will be met with a swift, overwhelming and decisive response, adding that any nuclear attack by North Korea against the U.S. or its allies is unacceptable and will result in the end of that regime. The EDSCG serves as a key annual forum on security strategy affecting the Korean Peninsula and broader Indo-Pacific. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Starting 9 a.m. this morning, North Korea sent more trash-carrying balloons across the border. Following the resumption of Pyongyang's balloon campaign after 25 days the night before, South Korea's military said Thursday the North launched a total of around 420 balloons from Wednesday night to the early hours of Thursday morning. It said around 20 of those balloons carrying paper and plastic bottles were found in Seoul and northern Gyeonggi-do province. The Joint Chief of Staff advised people to report fallen balloons to the police or military and not to touch them. The North has launched thousands of balloons carrying trash since late May. In protest against anti-Pyongyang leaflets sent by North Korean defectors and activists here in South Korea. And in response to the balloons, South Korea has activated frontline loudspeakers to blast broadcast propaganda messages and K-pop songs. South Korea's economy, which saw a strong performance in the first quarter, saw a downturn for the second quarter of this year. This has been mostly attributed to the base effect and high imports. Our An Song Jin brings the latest figures. South Korea's economy contracted in the second quarter compared to the first quarter this year. According to data released by the Bank of Korea on Thursday, the country's gross domestic product from April till June shrunk by 0.2 percent compared to the previous quarter. It's the first time in 18 months for the on-quarter growth to be negative. This is mostly attributed to the base effect caused by a relatively high GDP growth of 1.3 percent in the first quarter. An increase in imports compared to exports was also behind the downturn. Production saw a growth of 0.8 percent as manufacturing for transportation equipment rose. Exports also rose on the back of outbound shipments for automobiles and chemical products. 
but net exports dropped as imports for petroleum and natural gas products went up. Private spending also saw a sluggish recovery as consumption of goods such as cars and clothing dropped, leading to a fall of 0.2 percent. Infrastructure and construction investment also fell compared to the previous quarter. Machinery investments, such as for semiconductor manufacturing equipment, decreased, while construction investment, which led the growth in the first quarter with an increase of 3.3 percent, also fell to 1.7 percent in the second quarter. Meanwhile, the country's gross national income, the total amount of money earned by people and businesses, was up 0.9 percent on quarter as net factor income from the rest of the world decreased. However, the real gross national income fell by 1.4 percent, which the Bank of Korea attributed to a worsening of trade conditions. Net foreign income, which is calculated by subtracting the income sent abroad by foreigners and foreign firms operating within the country from the total income earned by Koreans from foreign sources, also fell compared to the previous quarter. An Song Jin, Arirang News. President Yoon Sogar pledged to better compensation for doctors and wider access to quality health care for patients as he visited an emergency medical center on Wednesday. According to the president's office, Yoon toured the Ujangbu Medical Center in Gyeonggi-do province to encourage medical staff and ensure medical services are run smoothly throughout the upcoming Chuseok holiday. Meeting with hospital officials, he asked what kind of difficulties they face as he acknowledged that the current compensation scheme for doctors is inadequate and that there is a regional imbalance in access to quality medical services. He promised to fully support reforms to ensure that those working in critical and essential medical services are supported with stronger compensation, especially in high-risk fields. The visit is the ninth time the president has visited a medical institution since he announced his signature health care plans in February, which sparked the ongoing strike by junior doctors and medical professors. The floor leader of the ruling People Power Party, Chu kyung has proposed a bipartisan body to discuss policies affecting people's everyday lives. This aims to speed up the legislative process for such livelihood bills. During a parliamentary address to today, Chu suggested what he called a livelihood legislation fast track, where the ruling and opposition blocs collaborate to quickly approve agreed bills. He also highlighted the importance of health care reform and urged medical students and doctors who have walked out of their post to return and engage in further talks with the government. A school shooting in the U.S. state of Georgia has left at least four dead and 30 others injured. The police have a 14-year-old suspect in custody as they continue to investigate a motive. Lee seung reports. As of July 2024, there were 35 incidents of shootings on school grounds and college campuses in the United States. That figure rose on Wednesday in the state of Georgia when a 14-year-old fired at students and teachers at Appalachia High School in Barrow County. Two students and two teachers were killed and 30 others were wounded in the shooting and authorities are investigating whether the victims were targeted. Initial reports said just nine were injured during the shooting, but that figure rose significantly. Police say the teenage shooter, who has been named as Colt Gray, surrendered to authorities quickly after being confronted. The local county sheriff said Gray was cooperating with authorities and would be charged with murder and tried as an adult. As police continue to question the suspect, no motive has been revealed and it's unknown whether there was any connection between the shooter and the victims. Authorities also say they do not know yet how the shooter was able to obtain the firearm. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the U.S. Department of Justice was ready to provide support to the victims and their families, adding he was devastated for the families involved. President Joe Biden also said he was mourning those who were killed, while calling on Congress to pass common-sense gun safety legislation. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. A Russian airstrike on the western Ukrainian city of Lviv on Thursday killed seven people and injured at least 64 others. According to the city's mayor, more than 50 houses in the city center were destroyed, along with two medical facilities and two schools. Among the dead were a mother and her three daughters. 
The Russian Defense Ministry claims that it struck the city's defense industry facilities using Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. The latest airstrike comes just a day after Russia struck a military institute in the central city of Poltava, killing 53. Hyundai Motor Company is on track to surpass a historic milestone this month, achieving 100 million vehicles sold. The accomplishment comes 56 years after the company began domestic sales in the 1960s and 48 years after starting exports in the 1970s. According to the company's yearly sales record and industry experts on Thursday, Hyundai reportedly needs to sell just 340,000 more vehicles to reach the milestone. The company has recently seen a strong sales growth over in the U.S., with August figures showing a 22 percent increase from the same time last year, marking the highest August sales on record. An international climate industry expo is currently taking place in South Korea's southeastern city of Busan. And this year, it's highlighting the importance of achieving carbon neutrality while showcasing various climate technologies from both home and abroad. Our Yi Soo-jin tells us more. South Korea is moving to further advance its transition into a sustainable carbon-free society. As part of these efforts, the government's hosting the 2024 World Climate Industry Expo for three days in Busan starting Wednesday under the theme of ushering in a carbon-free energy era with climate technologies. This year's expo is also significant because it's being co-hosted by the International Energy Agency. The Korean government working with the IEA hand in hand to put this uh, expo uh, uh, together and the companies, governments, who position themselves rightly in the next chapter of the global energy economy will have an advantageous position. And true to its theme, the climate technologies of more than 180 companies and government-affiliated organizations worldwide are being showcased. RWE, a German renewable energy company, is in attendance to expand its Korean offshore energy pipeline. Offshore energy involves generating energy from resources located at sea, and RWE is known for its offshore wind technology that harnesses power from water-based wind turbines. South Korea is considered a promising market for international companies like RWE due to its ambitious decarbonization goals. We feel Korea has a strong need to decarbonize in order to keep an export competitive economy. Many of the Korean companies have already been exporting many different products, whether they be wind turbine towers. Korean companies have become globally recognized for their climate technology, such as Pasco Holdings with Hyrex or hydrogen reduction steelmaking. There is a huge focus on developing technology that will help achieve carbon neutrality in the steel industry, which is why many companies abroad are showing interest in our Hyrex technology. And in the public sector, Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power was chosen in July as a preferred bidder to build nuclear reactors in the Czech Republic. A model of the APR 1400, the basis for the APR 1000 reactor that's part of the Czech deal, was on display at the event. With demand for climate technology expected to continue growing worldwide as nations strive to transition to a more sustainable future, South Korea is expected to emerge as a leader in the sector with advanced technologies like these. Isujin, Arirang News, Busan. This Wednesday, September 4th, marked Taekwondo Day, and this year a special event celebrated both the day and the 30th anniversary of Taekwondo's inclusion in the Olympic Games. And here, a new futuristic type of Taekwondo competition was introduced as well. Our Choi Soo has this report. On Wednesday, a grand ceremony for Taekwondo Day was held at Taekwondo One in Bujugun County, Jeollabukdo Province. Taekwondo, a traditional Korean martial art, was officially introduced as an Olympic sport on September 4th in 1994. Because of this, South Korea has designated the date as Taekwondo Day each year. This year, the ceremony celebrated both Taekwondo Day and the 30th anniversary of its inclusion in the Olympics. Gold medalist Park Tae-jun and Kim Yoo-jin from the Paris Olympics a few weeks ago also participated in the celebrating the day. I've been here often, so the event felt more relaxed and comfortable for me. 
I'm also grateful that we were invited to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Taekwondo. It was so nice to be here because I'm familiar with this place. Moreover, the first ever 2024 International Virtual Taekwondo Urban Championships created by the Taekwondo Promotion Foundation were held. Virtual Taekwondo is a new type of Taekwondo competition that takes place in a virtual space. Players attach sensors equipped with motion tracking technology to their arms and legs with VR equipment and compete as virtual characters in a digital space. Unlike traditional Taekwondo, age and weight classes don't matter in this format. In the championships, 35 competitors from five countries, including South Korea, Singapore and Luanda, will compete until Thursday. The chairman of the TPF expressed that it envisions a new leap forward through virtual Taekwondo. September 4th marks 30 years since Taekwondo became an Olympic sport and our Taekwondo Promotion Foundation is now focused on the next 30 years for Korea. Yi Dabin, this year's bronze medalist in the Paris Games, also stated that she enjoyed the unique appeal of virtual Taekwondo through a match at the event. It felt like a very short time and was less exhausting. I could use various kicks without any hesitation. I think one of the biggest advantages is that players can compete without physically fighting. I believe viewers will find it very entertaining. The International Olympic Committee decided to create an official eSports Olympics, and the first edition will be held in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 2025. South Korea plans to register the virtual Taekwondo as an official sport in the first ever eSports Olympics, preparing a new future for the Korean martial art. Cha Seung, Arirang News, Muju. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. We begin today in the U.S., where the Justice, State and Treasury Departments announced coordinated action on Wednesday to counter alleged Russian interference in the 2024 U.S. presidential election. The U.S. charged and sanctioned some 10 Russian state media executives while restricting Kremlin-based broadcasters, claiming Moscow is behind what the U.S. calls a widespread election interference campaign. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland accused a state broadcaster, RT, formerly known as Russia Today, of paying a Tennessee company 10 million U.S. dollars to create and distribute content to U.S. audiences with hidden Russian government messaging. RT editor-in-chief Margarita Simonian was listed as one of the 10 people sanctioned for attempting to bring down public trust in our institutions. Two entities were additionally sanctioned, 32 internet domain names were seized, and the U.S. government has offered a $10 million reward for information on hackers in the group Russian Angry Hackers Did It. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby said that Russia's program aims to reduce support for Ukraine, bolster pro-Russian policies and interests, and influence U.S. voters, while a Treasury official said that American influencers are being covertly recruited. The Russian state media, RT, responded to U.S. accusations by joking that, quote, three things are certain in life, death, taxes, and RT's interference in the U.S. elections. Now to Brazil, where firefighters on Wednesday succeeded in reducing a massive wildfire that has burned for two days and destroyed 20 percent of the national forest of Brasilia, a conservation area outside the country's capital. The fire broke out at the peak of the dry season in an area where over 56 square kilometers of woodland protect springs, which are the source of 70 percent of Brasilia's freshwater. An official in charge of managing the forest called the fires an environmental crime, but couldn't confirm if the fires were started intentionally. The forest had already been halved in size in 2022, when far-right former president Jair Bolsonaro approved the land for urban development. Consumers in the Middle East are reportedly boycotting Coca-Cola and Pepsi, as global Western brands face backlash in the Israel-Gaza conflict. Other American brands, such as McDonald's and Starbucks, are also facing anti-Israel boycotts, with market share for global brands falling 4% in the first half of 2024 in the Middle East, according to Nielsen IQ. This, however, has fueled an increase in the sales of local sodas. 
In Egypt, sales of Cola brand V7 tripled, including exports in the Middle East and the wider region compared to last year. This contrasts the 7% sales decline for Western beverage brands in the first half of the year across the region where sales of Coca-Cola in some countries, including Egypt, declined by double-digit percentage points until the end of June. Australian Olympian breakdancer Rachel Gunn, also known as Ray Gunn, has apologized to the nation's breakdancing community for the backlash following her controversial performance at the Paris Games, but insisted that her record speaks to her being the country's best B-girl. The 37-year-old was eliminated from the B-girls competition with a score of zero, prompting both ridicule and praise on social media for her performance, which included hopping like a kangaroo and flailing on the floor. Gunn, who lectures in cultural studies at Sydney's Macquarie University, apologized but added she can't control how people react. When asked by TV channel Network 10 whether she believes she's Australia's best female breakdancer, she added that she was the top-ranked Australian B-girl in 2020 and 2022 and 2023. Kim Siong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. It felt like summer was making a comeback yesterday under bright skies in the capital. We even woke up to the first tropical night in nine days this morning. Our heat advisory has been expanded to more of the western regions for now, but the east will be a scorcher as well. Central regions should have 3 to 4 degrees lower daytime highs with 5 to 10 millimeters of showers. Jeju Island could see up to 20 millimeters before all letting up tonight. Rain brings a slight heat relief to Seoul at 29 degrees, which is about 4 degrees lower than yesterday with spotty rain around mid-afternoon. Meanwhile, southern provinces will be under plenty of sunshine again with very strong UV rays. Now, passing rain is in the forecast in most parts tomorrow, and it seems like this year's summer just doesn't want to let go. We'll be seeing highs in the low 30s through the first half of September. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That wraps up our midday edition of Arirang News. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.